Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift. Here with Benji for the UCI Esports World Championships preview this Saturday, February the 26th at 6 p.m. UK time, 7 p.m. European time. It dovetails nicely. Just roll straight over from Omloop into this. It's live on Zwift's YouTube channel because Zwift has been selected as the platform on which the World Championships is held. So if you don't know, Zwift's not just a training platform or the social virtual group rides. It's also a platform for racing, and it's what the UCI Worlds are going to be held on. Previous winners include riders you may be familiar with, like Jason Osborne, who won in 2020. He also he got a stagiaire air contract on Quickstep last year and was quite good in a Slovakia TT. Ashley Moorman Pasio on the women's side, probably top four climber in the world. Rides for SD Works has been a domestique last year, but this year probably gets some opportunities. Both of these riders will be competing on Saturday amongst others. But we'll go into all the riders to watch. Benji, how did riders qualify for world champs? Because it's not like uh, road race world championships where their federation selects them. How do they qualify for Zwift Esports world champs? It's a bit of a combination. First, you've got qualifier rounds, so five qualifier races, one in each continent, to be able to qualify to race the world championships. Now, riders were invited to these qualifiers to be able to compete in those, to get an opportunity to try and fight for a spot in the world championships by their results and performances in category A Zwift races. For the men, that's four watts per kilogram, and for the women, that was 3.7 that they needed to achieve to be able to uh, get invited to these qualifiers. Now, when you want to qualify, you need to get a top five in these, and then your performance will be verified by Zada, which is basically a Zwift anti-doping agency, the uh, Zwift side of WADA, where they basically uh, cross-reference real data to your Zwift data to see whether uh, it all adds up and so forth. After that, you get added to the roster of your national federation, registered for a whereabouts system and anti-doping testing pool. And next to that, you get sent hardware for the world championships because, uh, well, obviously they want to make it as fair as possible, the race. They want to make sure that every single rider has the same trainer to ride on. And next to that, also in-game, you'll have the same bikes and wheels selected and so forth to make it all fair throughout. Now, next to these qualifiers, you've also got the option of uh, being selected by the federation just like that. So uh, I don't know what percentage is qualifiers, what percentage is federation, but in total, there's quite a bit of riders at the start line. Some teams with like one to three riders, some teams with like five to eight riders. So in the end, there's a bit of difference there. Now, uh, when it comes to the route, it's actually uh, quite a hilly parkour. And that's interesting because the qualifiers that we just spoke about also happened on a hilly parkour, a different one though. The qualifiers happened on the figure eight parkour on uh, Zwift, which had, I think, four hills in total, quite steep, the second and the fourth climb. And this time around, it's got quite a hilly parkour as well, right? Yeah, New York City course, which if you're listening to this before, we are having our LRCP group Zwift ride tonight on Tuesday, the 22nd of February, 6 p.m. UK time, 7 p.m. European time, same time of the day that World Champs is on. We're doing a New York City course in that Q&A group ride. And there's recon rides throughout this week to check out that course. It's also the same time next week, our group ride. But this course, 55 k's in length, 54.7, 942 meters of altitude, and it's punchy. The big climbs, the New York City KOM Ford, 1.36 Ks, 6.5%, but fake news climb. It's got like 18% pinches in it. And there's a smaller climb, a few Ks before it in this circuit. So there's pretty good climbers on the start list. And we were going to discuss this, Benji, compared to a flat course where maybe you need to like just power can win or like a long, steady climb of – a 25-minute climb on a hilly course with irregular gradients. You were saying off-air you think the Zwift or 
on e-racing specialists will have an advantage over people who've been riding more on the road because of timing various power-ups like why do you think that well, in general, first of all, throughout the race, there's a lot of ups and downs and not a completely flat area, which means that they're going to have to try and stay in the draft of other riders as much as possible, as ideally as possible. And people who know the swift mechanics of drafting perfectly will be able to know which positions they need to take, at what point, at a certain point, they need to fasten a bit because they know that the peloton will probably speed up at this point. And other riders that are not that used to Zwifting might be later and might be delayed in their reaction and might see, oh, the riders seem to be going fast and now I need to up my uh, degree of tempo here, my uh, pedaling, because otherwise I'm not going to be able to follow this tempo and I'm not going to be able to be in that draft. And if you're not in that draft at the right moment, you're going to have to spend a bit more watts and that's going to benefit the riders that are used to doing this stuff and are riding experiencedly on this parkour. Now, I do think that with this parkour, I think a lot of riders are going to take a relaxed feeling through it where, no, not relaxed as in riding, but uh, as in they're going to try and save as much energy as possible for the latter part, I would expect. Conservative. Yeah, I think so as well. Certainly there's a few people that might attack on the first one, try and get a, few, a bit of attention, try and do something there. But we know that draft matters a lot in this uh, game, basically, the gamification of Zwift, which means that a lot of people will try and play defensively, stay in the draft, save energy that way, make sure they can follow as much as possible on the steeper sections on climbs. That draft will not matter as much. That's more where your weight comes in, because what's per kilogram and so forth. And as a consequence, there it's going to be more uh, trying to uh, make sure you're in the front group or if uh, a group gets away, decide not to because you want to spend the energy on other climbs later on in the race. But you said the power-ups, they're actually predetermined for the uh World Championships, I asked Ed Laverack, so shout out to that guy. Uh, there's three predetermined power-ups signed up, and it's also predetermined where they are in the race that was sent to the federations in, according to uh, uh, the UCI two-ish weeks in advance. I don't know the position at which the uh, power-ups are given, but I do know the three that are available. Feather, which reduces your weight by 10% for 15 seconds. Basically a power-up, by the way. I'll add this first. I think it's is, just uh, before the climbs. Uh, there's an intermediate sprint or something before the climb, so it could indeed be at that spot. Yeah. Now, I do want to explain power-ups for people that haven't actually uh, ridden on Zwift yet. It's basically uh, like if you're in Mario Kart and you're riding with your car around, you can suddenly throw a banana and like you, you get that option of throwing a banana. In Zwift, you get the option of, for example, reducing your weight for, for 15 seconds by 10% when you, when you push that action. That's how a power-up basically works. Does that remotely make sense, that comparison, you think? I think so. Actually, that's a good point, Benji. <laughs> there's, no, there's no negative ones in Zwift, are there, where you can just <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, I wouldn't mind seeing that. We'll write that yeah. down and talk to the people in Zwift. Um, but... Yeah, that'd probably be too controversial. But yeah, yeah. there's Van as well, yeah. uh, which increases draft effect by 50% for 30 seconds. That's used, best used at high speeds on the flat or descent under draft. And there's Helmet as well, Benji, which you might explain. Yeah, Helmet basically, uh, I think it's also called Aero Boost, uh, reduces your CDA, which is your, uh, I don't know the English word for it, but like the spot at which the, arrow comes in how, how do you say that <laughs> word in english come on open of like is in dutch your <laughs> like frontal area I yes. don't know. yeah your frontal area drag coefficient things engineer things yes we are experts. yes <laughs> it reduces that making sure that you're more arrow basically and that's best used at higher speed once again on the flat in the sense especially when no draft is available because then you're when there's draft well well, no, when, it's like in TTs because CDA is what people are always talking about in TTs where you're obviously not drafting anyone and you're, you're hitting the wind yourself. So, yeah, as you said, Benji, drafting is less, it's less relevant. Uh, but tactics-wise, previously we saw that 
not all teams ride as a team, kind of like road world championships sometimes. Uh, or previously, Germany's tactics were a bit of a free-for-all, but in the end, Jonas Rapp did help out Jason Osborne to win the world championships. So some teams will ride as a free-for-all strategy. Some teams will ride as a team. But I think actually that it's also dependent on if the riders have ridden together before because – Let's take a look at the Zwift racing scene, for example. You've got that Zwift Racing League Premier Division thing, and in that you've got certain teams already as esports teams riding together. Some of these riders in the same teams have ridden together in those teams throughout the year, so might have tactics together with each other, but in some other countries you'll have riders that have never ridden together in a team before. So I think it's also dependent on what kind of team you have and if your riders have already worked together or not in previous races, that's a guess of mine, to be honest. Likely winners will do a bit of a preview. I don't think you can bet on this, which, you know, I'm a degenerate, so I was looking, <laughs> can I find a market for this? Uh, <laughs> but deep field in terms of ability to win this race, lots of riders are showing, for example, that they're coming into it with good form. Some riders like Ovet Mullen Passio might have appreciated longer climbs, but it's a balanced parkour. Uh, we still think lighter rider understands Swift and the power ups and is conservative and <laughs> we say that conservative in the race and can strike on the final <laughs> hill. Uh, someone will probably do <laughs> a thirty minute solo, but that's what we think would be the typical strategy: is sprint on the final hill. But women's race riders to watch. First of all, Mulman Pazio, she, I think, won the Monday, last Monday, the Zwift Racing League Premier Division, which is up the Epic KOM. She beat Christian Kulczynski, who's an indoor specialist. She won. Uh, but who else do we have here, Benji, that caught your eye in the women's race? I wrote down Kristen Kulczynski, the rider you just named. <laughs> she oh, had a yeah. pretty breakout season, was full of at the American qualifiers for the World Championships as well. So I kind of looked at the qualifiers to look at our riders that can do well here, could also do that well at the World Championships, and then try to cross-reference that with the results in the uh, Swift Racing League. And you find some in- interesting stuff there, just like Kristen Kulczynski having pretty good form at the moment. Now, you've also got... Riders, also once again a World Tour cyclist, Sarah Gigante. She's riding for Movistar these days, was a runner-up in the previous UCI Esports World Championships that Roman Pasio won, so definitely has an option there. Does she ride enough Zwift to be able to compete against the actual experienced Zwift riders that do it every day? I don't know. I can't tell you that. That's what we're going to see in the World Championships, but there's just plenty of riders that are able to uh, do well here, like Zoe Langham from Great Britain. She won the European qualifiers, and to be honest, she looked pretty impressive in that. Rode impressively throughout the entire Zwift Racing League Premier Division this entire period. So that's also a rider I'd be looking at. Anyone else catching your eye? Well, Britain just have a strong team. They've got Lily Gardner, six of the Europeans, strong climber. Will she work for Zoe Langham? Will she do bait attacks up the road? Will she pace her on the final climb? That's something to watch. Um, and also Shayna Powers. She won American qualifiers. And Louise Howback from Denmark, eight at European qualifiers and an experienced rider. But Pix Benji, who are you going with? I'm going with uh, Mulman Pazio again. Okay, I'm going to go with... Ooh, I think Shayna Powell. Mm, should I? Shayna Powers, yes. Okay. One of the American qualifiers looked strong in that. Perhaps not the favorite of many, I think, for this race instantly, but why not? Before we pick our favorites for the men's race, I should add that the women's and men's races are equal in all aspects for the World Championships. Same course, same length of course, same coverage, same prize money. So, yeah, credit to Zwift for that. The men's race... Matthias De Rosa from Belgium, runner-up in the European uh, qualifiers. Benji, why are you laughing? Is, is, How's the ruin even, Belgian even, name? Even, even, when, even when we're doing an eSports World Chance preview, I'm getting grief for uh, my Belgian mispronunciation. How is it, <laughs> how's it said? Matthias De Rosa. <laughs> okay, De Rosa. <laughs> Derek Rose. All right. Strong climber, one of the highest-ranked riders on Zwift Power, and you can check out Zwift Power, which has 
sort of if you're a statistics nerd like we are, was Pekila, a lot of information on Swift Power. Uh, but Belgium's strong. There's Lionel Vuyas in as well. But he, did you get to the bottom of this, Benji? Because he rode qualifiers for Croatia. Like I, I was trying to get to the bottom to why he did that. And it's probably something to do with the ability to qualify, but I didn't get it completely so if someone can point it out in the comment section or throw it at us on twitter that would be nice but you're right Lionel fujazin is also a rider that could do uh pretty well he won the european qualifiers uh in november because that's when they were written he's got a 407 watt ftp which is a lot more than i have so congratulations mate 747 watts for one minute so doing that on a, a finishing climb like this should uh, give a pretty good result, I would dare to say. And he's arguably one of the riders I would eye as uh, the favorites based on that previous thing. But he's not a, I would say, born winner. I think he won like two Zwift races so far from like actual competition levels. So and Vine beat him. Didn't Vine beat him in Zwift Academy? Yes, as well. I think. Uh, Australian on Belgian violence. And Australia came out on top. Anyway. Other riders, Chris McGlinchey from Ireland, lots of experience competing in esports races, strong climber. There's Takato Ikeda from Japan, uh, climber as well, aggressive rider who will probably try and go on the longer New York City KOM Ford climb. And Jason Osborne, who, I don't know, what would you do if you were Osborne Benji? Like he won the previous esports world championships. He's so good at Zwift and Esports, which is growing and becoming more popular. And and he had the Stagiaire contract at, at Quickstep. What do you think he's going to – or if you were his agent or trusted advisor, what would you tell him to focus on? Well, I, I don't know what I would tell him to focus on, but I knew that when he won that uh, World Championships back in the day, he said that he wanted to focus on after the Olympics, rowing, go towards actual on-road cycling and keep – Esports cycling as a backup if road cycling doesn't work out. And I'm not sure if that's the case now because he had that trainership, traineeship. I don't know uh, if he is now going to the backup of esports again as a consequence of that. I haven't spoken to him. So uh, I don't know that aspect. But I would dare to say he definitely has a talent to uh, be a road cyclist as well based on like one of his first results was a proper uh, prologue in uh, Turf Slovakia, if I recall correctly. Then again, that fits perfect with his 5 to 7 watt power that he has from rowing. So perhaps on other pieces of terrain, that might not work out too well. But I don't know. I uh, I think we should definitely still call him one of the uh, stronger riders on the terrain. You know, Zrap performed pretty well in supporting him towards the end of that uh, World Championships last time. Because like you said, free-for-all uh, team back in the day, Germany. Now, I also want to take a look at Freddy Ovet. Because uh, in all honesty, of course, Australia, one of my favorite countries in the world after Belgium, right? Um, Ovid wrote strongly during the virtual Tour de France 2020, consistently strong throughout basically every Zwift race that the guy rides. He's really strong. But the thing I'm not 100% sure with is if he fits on the terrain that we've got here as if they start punching on the final hill, can he punch as fast as the real punches on the parkour? And that's where I'm like, perhaps that might not be exactly his kind of cake yeah i think you would have preferred a longer climb and like we saw in swift racing league last week he i think did the epic kom in just over 13 minutes and so he's in good shape but as benji said this is a shorter climb than that and yeah does he have the punish probably he'll definitely be marked uh as well there's also jay vine here who we just saw had so he was sick i think in antalya still recovering from that at the start of algarve where remco and co was but then came good on the last malal climb which was 2.5 k's at nine and a half percent which is not dissimilar a little bit longer but not dissimilar to this longer climb here and we're saying okay fine race on the road now but he's an experienced swift rider and he knows how the power-ups work, tactics, etc. And I'm sure he can shake off any rust he has. So he's coming in probably not in his top shape, but still in decent enough shape to be doing well on Malhal. So one to watch as well. Who are you picking in the men's race, Benji? I'm going to go for a uh, who? I think Matthias de Rose. Yeah, why not? 
There we go. Belgium. I'm going with Ovet. I think Ovet will win. And okay, Belgium versus Australia. This yeah. is the thing now. <laughs> That's what we do. Now it's time <laughs> for our interview with Neve Bradbury, the 19-year-old on Canyon Shram Racing, who won Zwift Academy previously, Neo Pro in 2021, looking good in the Australian National Champs at the start of this year. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. Neve Bradbury, winner of the fifth edition of Zwift Academy, just finished her Neo Pro year at Canyon Shram Racing, about to embark on her second year. How are you going? I don't know you're, you're pretty ripped up. Have you just, is there a training camp you've just done or are you going to or have you actually got racing in the next couple of weeks? Uh, all of the above, yes. I just came from a training camp in Mallorca. Got back last week. Now I'm here in Girona for a week before we go to another training camp in Valencia on Sunday. And then I race uh, Valencia the following week. So is that the second Mallorcan trip? Because you had the – there was the Zwift Academy in December. Uh, when was that actually filmed? Um, uh, yeah, so Zwift Academy was filmed – when was it? Like mid-November? Okay. Um, for a week, and then I actually went home to Australia for six weeks, and then I flew straight to Mallorca for the camp. Okay, yeah, and I should have mentioned as well, Neve, just off the back of two seconds in the U23 Criterium and Road Race in Australian National Championships, and then going into, I think, the Esports World Championships, how are you balancing preparing for that, participating in that with your road program with Canyon Shram as well, or do they just give you full license to go for that this month? Um, well, this is definitely different to road racing, but at the moment I'm going pretty hard for the Valencia tour. And then, I mean, I'm doing races every week on Swift, so I can kind of fit that in, but it's just kind of balancing both, not really going hard for one over the other and valencia tours this that this sunday i think will start soon uh it starts next not next thursday okay. the week after sorry it's like two weeks and you've just finished your first year do you do you know what your role will be this year or do you have any goals this year to go for your own GC in any races or is it more stage hunting? What do you want to get out of this year? Um, we'll see how we go. Last year I was just a domestic trying to learn, find my feet. Yeah. Hopefully this year I can do a little bit better. I mean, I think I'm still going to be a domestic, but maybe I can hedge my bets and go for a stage podium or win even, you know, we'll see how we go. Okay, sure. And how has what what did you sort of learn, or what were the biggest like eye opening things for you last year, uh, coming from getting into the world tour through Zwift and then straight into racing, really? And I'm I'm friends with Jay Vine as well, and he like finished Zwift Academy and then was almost had to fly straight over. What was the the biggest shocks, even off the bike as well? Because like as Australians moving over, it's like it's a huge upheaval as well moving to Europe. Yeah, in terms of racing, the biggest shock was just like the pure number of riders in each race. Um, trying to navigate around the bunch was a bit difficult and hard to get used to. Um, in terms of off the bike, just having to move overseas and really start being an adult because <laughs> I was <left laughs> 18. Um, so I lived at home with my parents. Like they pretty much did, yeah, they did a lot for me. So I had to <laughs> become an adult really quickly. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still, I still haven't figured that out myself. But, but yeah, like, even just uh, same in Andorra, like I'll be like, oh, I'll just go and get something and it'll be one thirty. go, everything shut. And it, it took me yeah. about five months to learn that yeah. nothing's open then. Or six, especially for Australians, we eat early, go out to dinner, try to go up to dinner, oh, 6 p.m. so I can go to bed early, nothing's yeah. open to eat dinner. Um, yeah, so funny. The amount of times that I've forgotten that the shop closed on Sunday like it's insane like <laughs> nearly every week I'm like oh no I'm gonna have to get go to a restaurant or whatever 
because that's the Sunday shop is the thing in Australia. In case people don't know, Sunday or I used to always do, especially when I was working as a lawyer. Sunday, I get all my grocery for the week. Whereas here, it's like mm. everyone gets like a, a little bit for they get they go to the shops every day. This, this is this could double as a podcast for like Australians struggling to adjust to Spanish culture, I guess. But um, how are you? Like, where do you think you're going to be in the esports world championships compared to, say, your condition for Zwift Academy, which you prepared for when you won? How do you think you are shaping up, especially with the form you had at the Criterium? I know it's not exactly the same, but coming second in the U23, I guess, uh, or fifth or sixth in the in the race itself um, with everyone. How do you think your form is at the moment? Yeah, I think the form's there. I have to be enough to get around road national road race um and i've now got another month of training i will have had a month month of training by the time e-world starts i don't know it's, i have, haven't worked raced e Worlds yet i haven't raced in a big field like that like this academy is the finals with five people so it's pretty different also like tactically it's different i don't know <laughs> really and I think your one of your best results last year was set mana cyclista Valenciana and you're doing you're doing Valencia tour soon. I think stage one you came top ten, um, one of your earlier races. Do you think your close the sort of best chance in terms of stages, like depending on the parkour, is like a hillier stage, but not a mountaintop finish, just something that where you still finish on the flat that has a lot of climbing in it is it sort of being a breakaway rider or you still haven't figured exactly out what type of rider you are um i probably haven't figured it out fully yet i haven't actually raised the hilltop finish um the pro peloton yet but i say i'd probably do pretty well in the hilltop finish um but even if it's also like just up and down all day um, like repeated efforts, probably also right out. But yeah, I'm still trying to figure it out, really. Well, so I mean, well, oh, sorry, not what I mean. What you said when you were saying you haven't done a hilltop finish, you did a lot of Belgian races where there's not going to be ten minute climbs. In that, it's like it, it's interesting in women's cycling how there aren't as many hilltop or mountaintop finishes or even twenty minute climbs as the men's parkour. That's changing. But riders like Ashley Mormon, for example, who's also a really strong indoor rider, you might not see her for a while, then you see Liège or like Norway and she actually gets certain riders then get a 30-minute uphill test. You know, oh, there's actually all these different riders who are good climbers, you just don't get to see it as often. So, yeah, maybe hopefully this year you get to do Norway or races like that. I know Romandy has a, yeah, exactly. a nasty one. Yeah, and also there's a few stages um, at the Tour de France, Saint Sebec, that uh, finish up a hill. So that'd be good. That's a good addition to the race calendar for riders like Ashley Moon, Pastier, and probably myself. Yeah, I think the it get that the Tour de France, Femme of Swift, it gets progressively harder. It's like first stage is Vibers or whoever sprint, and it's it harder. Uh, second and third are kind of like for Cassia, and then backloaded last two are like. Really hard mountain stages. So I'm interested to see what happens there. I know Van Vleuten probably go nuclear, but yeah, we, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll see what happens there. But yeah, do you know what races you'll be doing apart from uh, Valencia? I have a rough, rough kind of guide. Um, sort of run probably off the cars because um, I'm a developing rider and it's probably just a bit above my pay grade. <laughs> Um, but maybe the Giro or something. I mean, we'll see how we go. Okay. Well, yeah. Best of luck from us at Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast this year, Neve, and as well at the Esports World Championships on Zwift coming up at the end of this month. I'm sure you'll do pretty well, particularly with the form you've been in judging from nationals. Thank you very much for having me. But thanks to Neve for coming on the podcast. We hope you enjoyed that interview and indeed this preview. We'll be watching this Saturday, February 26th at 6 p.m. UK time, 7 p.m. European time, live on the Zwift YouTube channel. Link down below should be pretty exciting. Ciao.